everyone. Welcome to the February 19th Adoption Parenting Inner Circle Call. This call is also heard as a seminar featuring Jeanette Yaffe and the topic, Children, How to Recognize Their Strengths in the Midst of Their Most Challenging Behaviors and How to Draw Their Resilience. Jeanette's been a dear friend of the Post Institute and Brian and I and Dr. Marcy's for years, and I'm just delighted that she is joining us tonight. Every time I talk to Jeanette, I feel re-inspired. She has such a, a lovely outlook. Um, she has a, an amazing professional background with all of her studies and experience. Um, but I think for most of us, we've met a lot of really professional professionals, and they are wonderful people. But Jeanette also comes from a deep history of foster care and adoption that really informs her understanding and her approach and her insights. So uh, for me, that probably gives you more credibility <laughs> than all of your degrees. <laughs> you've lived you've lived a life, and I appreciate that about you, Jeanette, and you have such a loving heart. And so well, I think this without further ado, take the floor, my dear. Well, I think this topic is why it's very dear to my heart because I think it has helped me be more resilient in my life as an adult. And I wish I had this perspective when I was a child. I wish my parents had been given this education. So um, let me start by saying I am a psychotherapist. I'm based in Los Angeles. And I see children who have been in multiple placements in foster care and who were adopted uh, domestically and internationally. I, um, my background is I was raised in, um, with my birth family for the first 15 months of my life and then was placed into foster care until I was seven and a half. And then I was adopted into another family at the age of seven and a half. So... I've had multiple transitions myself, um, and I come to this work with great passion and a real feel for the child's perspective in their experience, and you know, pointing out that their strengths is so important. So let me just jump right into it. Why did I choose this topic? Because I want to Can you talk to a little help. louder? Can you, oh, am I not loud enough? Yeah, that's better. Oh, okay. I want to help parents recognize their child's strengths because we want to look through a different lens of looking through a strength-based perspective because we want to focus on what you want more from your child behaviorally and make that more prominent. And I'll tell you why. Because if we focus on the motive which is which is typical with these children who have hysterical behaviors, challenging behaviors. It's very hard to stay connected with them in those in the midst of these behavioral episodes. So, if we focus and what tends to happen is parents focus on the negative motive, thought or feeling that is connected with the behavior. So, for instance, a parent might say uh, he just wants his my attention. He doesn't care how he affects me. He just wants to make me mad. He's just trying to manipulate me. Well, when we say things like that to a child who is challenged emotionally, behaviorally, let me tell you, they're going to give you more of that. That's what you're going to be making more prominent. So when we focus on strengths, and I'm going to tell you how to do that, you're going to get more of that. And what it's going to do is help the child regulate their affect, understand where they're coming from, understand their own motives. The thing is, the way you help a child change is by bringing awareness to the strength in their behavior. If they can't recognize that, they're not going to be willing or able to change the behavior. Because more than likely, they're going to de develop with what's called a negative view of themselves, which is that negative self that feels bad, worthless, unlovable. 
And what the term is, is, and I'm sure you've heard it on the call here with um, in the inner circle of parenting, uh, is shame. Uh, most of these kids are walking around with shame. Shame is the feeling, I'm all bad, I'm all worthless, I'm all, all unlovable because my first family or my second family or my third, fourth, or fifth family did not keep me, did not want me, so they feel unwanted. Okay. Now I'm explaining what shame is because it's really important to understand why we're focusing on strengths. So if that's what the child is feeling, and a lot of these kids are walking around with this baggage, that's their view of themselves. Okay. Because this is how they feel about themselves, they feel that there is nothing they can do to fix that part of themselves. They don't feel that they can change themselves. And, as you know, as a result, they're going to deny, make excuses, blame others about their behavior because they innately feel at their core, I'm deficient, there's something wrong with me, so that's why they resist, okay? Because they're so scared to, they don't want to disappoint their parents. No child wants to disappoint their parents. And really understanding that piece is so important when parenting a foster or adopted youth. So what happens is, and this is what we see across the board with kids who've had early trauma, is they become excessively shameful. When a child has excessive shame, they it interferes with their ability to develop guilt. If we don't if we cannot develop guilt in our psyche, that will prevent us from accepting responsibility for our actions. Mm. Wow. And parents are constantly saying, and they come into my practice, he cannot take responsibility for his action. Mm -hmm. That is an indicator for me as a therapist and for all the parents listening, your child is living in shame. Mm -hmm. They cannot see past themselves. They can only see themselves. And the way I explain it, it's like they live in a bubble and the bubble surrounds them, and there's a mirror in the bubble, and they see a reflection of themselves that is not good. It is not worthy. It is not of value. They don't see that part of themselves. So the way to pull them out is to point I, out. Hang on just a minute, Jeanette. I want you yeah. to back up and say that one more There's time strength. about not being able to see past themselves. That was so well said that I really so want to just, hear that. For years, I lived in shame. Shame, 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 shame. And whenever someone pointed out what was wrong with me, I, of course, would be resistant and deny and excuse and push that away because I couldn't tolerate someone pointing out again how bad I was. Because the thing is, in, a bu in this bubble, all we see is the negative self. We cannot see past that self. And that's why these kids cannot feel for others yet. Can they eventually? Yes. But for right now, you're dealing with these challenging behaviors because, and this is, and, and, and I, I'm just saying from my own experience, I see a lot of parents, they feel manipulated. They feel the child's um, manipulating them is uh, just wants their attention. They're jealous. They're, um, they're just trying to get away with something. He just wants to make me mad. These negative motives that parents, of course, put out there because they're feeling helpless, hopeless, and angry because it's hard to understand. But I'm, I hope that I'm helping you understand why they're acting out. And as Brian always says, children act out not because they want attention. It's because they need attention. 
So the focus of this call is what is what is the need that we need to meet. So, and I just wanted to point out um, there there have been studies on understanding the difference between guilt and shame, and they say that individuals who are rated high on measures of shame are rated low on measures of empathy for others. So really, and let me just say also, if you, the way you know your child is living in shame is they're highly defensive, you feel, they feel easily criticized, they have a high sensitivity to any perceived threat of rejection, um, and they're resistant to being redirected, which we see a lot in schools. They have a hard time receiving, oh, no, that's not right. This is how you do it. When they make a mistake, they literally feel like a mistake, and that's why it's hard. they become defensive in that moment, resistant, they can't learn. They become stressed out. So, you know, this is an understanding for educators as well. And um, so the other piece of the research shows that individuals who experience guilt readily when wrong, they are rated high on measures of empathy. And when you think about it, it really makes a lot of sense. So today we're talking about what is it that we want to focus on and make more prominent within our children. So we want to develop a positive view for them so that they can see their positive attributes because right now all that they see are their negative attributes. And let me tell you, this is a practice. It takes, it's a practice you will be doing and incorporating every day. It will take time. Be gentle with yourself. And you may recognize there are parts within you that have shame of fear of making a mistake. The more we can model for our children when we make a mistake, we're not a mistake, and that mista having mistakes in life, making mistakes, is how we learn. We need to make mistakes, and we can still feel good about ourselves. Kid, these kids need to hear both sides. So, um, So how do you focus on... A strength. What I've done is I've printed out, and what you all can do is print out there's list a list of strengths from the internet, and there's plenty out there. So you can start making that more prominent in your own mind. This is what I'm going to focus on: thoughtful, respectful, caring generous. I'm going to pull this out of my child. I'm also going to develop this within my child. So um, let me go to one of the questions so I can have a real, uh, real uh, a question from Michelle Jean Gillis. The, the yes. last question that you had emailed me. And so her question to me was, my most challenging situation with my adopted seven-year-old has to do with her competitiveness. She is always hypervigilant about one-upping whatever another child says. I understand that this stems from having to compete for attention in her orphanage. What are some strategies that I can use to calm her fear that, is she, that she is not enough as she is? I want to speak to her or her heart because my reassurance of loving her just the way she is doesn't seem to make a difference in that particular behavior. Okay. So how would you point out her strengths? So when she becomes competitive, it's, wow, I really admire your determination. You, are re you really want to win. You really want to be good at something. I see that in you. She needs to see what's, what's driving her motive. You really try hard at things. Wow. I admire you for not giving up. You seem really proud about yourself when you do that. 
So pointing out to her positive aspects of herself. Now, another piece of this is when you're focusing on the strength, you can also focus on the vulnerability. And the vulnerability is, as Brian talks about, it's what's driving the behavior. What are the feelings? What is driving that behavior? So when a child is, is in this situation, very competitive, it's as if a part of her feels, and I talk a lot in parts with kids, especially kids who have shame, because they can only see one part. But I want to help them see there are many parts within them. Yes, there may be a scared part that feels if, if they don't win, no one is going to like them. And there's no but there. And there's another part of you that can do it, can really take the time, can really relax, even if it's hard when you don't win all the time, that there's a part of you that can be confident that things will go your way. So what I'm doing is I'm growing another part within that child so they can start to recognize I'm not just all one deficient unworthy person. I have other parts that are strengths, that I, I can be something and I can feel good about that. Um, so that, that would be how I would answer that question for her. Um, that we can still feel good about ourselves if we don't always win. And, and a parent can talk to their child, wow, I see how much you really want to be good at that. And I also see a part of you that is learning that we can't always win all the time and that you can still feel good about yourself. You see what that parent is doing for that child? That's it's beautiful. Like planting a seed. And... It, it takes our effort is we have to see it. But if we're always looking at negative motives, that's all we're going to see and that's all we're going to get. We have to be the eye in the shame to pull them out because they cannot do it on their own. They need us. They need us. And, and you know, if we have a blueprint, as a parent, and I'm a parent of an almost seven-year-old, if we have a blueprint of our own shame, it's going to be hard for us at first because we're going to recognize who did this for me when I was a child. I needed this too. I needed this self-esteem to grow inside of me. And maybe, you know, there have been many families that have, parents who have had that. And they think, well, why doesn't my child have this? Because they didn't get it and they need it. And we have to develop it within them. So that's one example right there. So now let me go to another. Um, and let me And let me just say that I had a. 14-year-old in my office today who knew I was doing this call based on strengths. And doing this, applying this technique with him, I cannot tell you, this, this was a child highly defiant, was in residential care, thought very lowly, low of himself. He lived in foster care, very negative, low self-concept. When we started pointing out his strengths, his determination, and I would find any diamond. If I see anything in a child, I'll pull it right out. Wow, you really want to be good at that. If they're playing with a toy and, and the child throws it across the room, wow, you really want to get that right. Wow, I like your determination. Let's try that again because there's another part of you that knows what to do. And sometimes it doesn't always go your way, but 
we're going to get it. We can get it. Um, uh, great job to control your anger. You know, I really thank you for saying thank you. I really admire you for being so thoughtful of me. I appreciate that. Thank you for thinking of me. Really pulling that out for children. Uh, so another question that I wanted to answer was Patty, Patty Rob, Robles. Robles. Mm-hmm. Robles, is she here? Uh, no, she actually she sent me an email that she wasn't going to be able to be on the call, but she was really looking forward to the oh. recording. Okay, so um, and I'll just briefly because this is a little long. Uh, the question was: Twelve-year-old girl placed two months ago in an adoptive home. She refuses to eat food the adoptive parent prepares. She will say, ew, that's gross. She'll throw the food in the trash. Um, She doesn't want adoptive parents to touch her food. She insists on doing all the preparation. However, doesn't always want to prepare food and ends up eating a bag of chips. Her previous foster home describes her as a carboholic. And right there, it just, I'm sure they said that to her. So what are they going to get? More of a carboholic. The child has been diagnosed with prediabetes. She knows she has to eat healthy. And I highlighted that. She knows, so there's a part of her that's growing that knows she needs to eat healthy. And she has to become a vegetarian, yet she hates most foods that are popular with vegetarians. Um... Uh, let's see, and I just want to point out one other thing here. Her bio mom used drugs. The child says, she, and was never there. The child says she has been pre- preparing her food even before she was big enough to see over the counter. She was also the caregiver and cook for her younger brother. Look at those strengths right there. I'm going to pull that right out of there. So, The adoptive parents are reading Beyond Consequences. Okay, so how do they deal with this? How are they going to help her change? So when I started reading this, I thought, you know, we need to point out, I would first point out, you know what, I see. I see in you. I'll just tell you, I'm going to point out one thing. A lot of these kids, the validation is they need to be seen, heard, and received really seen by the parent because what we're looking at is their internal world that they feel so shameful of. I see that you know what's good for you. I see that in you. You, You're a born leader. Wow. You cooked for your brother. You cooked for you. You really know how to take care of yourself. You've learned that. You've been in charge of your feeding for so long now, it must be really hard to relax now and know things will work out. I get that. I admire you for all your strength and your courage. It must be so hard, now I'm pointing out a vulnerability, to know one, to know this way that you've been living, and now you're here with us. And now I'm asking you to do something different. That must be so hard. And I see strength in you, that you know what's good for you. And what she's going to feel is heard, recognized, validated. I admire you for not giving up. Because that's how you've been living, and Mm -hmm. I get that. I would recommend if this is a child coming to my office with a food issue, I would ask and I if I'm going to in if I'm going to ask a child to change, to do something different, I'm always going to ask them, would you be willing to would you be willing to let me you know, there's a a plate, would you be willing to let me make one part of your dinner. Would you be willing to let me do that for you? I would ask 
the child if I would ask the parent to ask the child that. Would she be willing? Most likely, and, and I'd like to hear feedback if she's willing to email me, um, if she's able to see if the child is able to be receptive to that and allow the mother to make one part. Because what we do is we expect these children to just change off the bat. We have to do it in baby, baby, baby steps. Um, while you're while you're talking, Jeanette, um, I quickly remember there's a, a really beautiful set of therapeutic fairy tales that Brian was a part of writing called The Forever Child. Um, and I don't think we offer it in our store anymore, but there's a website that can easily be found. And I'm just going to say it while we're on the call so other people can reference it. Um, it's www.foreverchild.net. And Nancy Clark is the author, and Brian was a co-author. And they're beautifully written, beautifully illustrated. And there's one in particular that speaks of a child um, who was uh, out in the woods and came to a home. And it's, it talks about the tale of anger and fear and how scary it is and what amazing survivors children can be. And they're great for sharing um, you know, to read with your child and be able to pick up some of those conversations and support the same thing you're talking about and just really, you know, I think it's so tempting to get scared as parents, especially when you hear medical diagnosis like pre-diabetes and, um, right. you know, it's scary. To and to, it. to right. Yeah, yeah, there's right away. A, a big urgency. Right away, good right. Lord, right away, absolutely. Um, and that's you know, to, to be able to, and that, that's, that's just going to be met with resistance because, like you said, until they're really, what was it you said, heard and seen and... Seen, heard, and received by the parent. Received. They will not be willing. Seen, they're heard, not and be, received. Yeah. Seen, heard, and received. received. When you say received to me, I, what I feel is like experience, like experience yes. me where I am, who I am, and all that I am, and not... To resist that feeling, um, I think felt. that's yes, yeah, it's really nice because I'll tell that's you, it's a great us, nugget. Yeah, us adoptees, I teach adult adoptees when someone hugs you, will you be will, would you be willing next time to really receive that hug? Let it inside because what is it doing? It's nurturing that shame. I'm unlovable. I'm unwanted. I do this in my office with kids. I say, okay, now we're going to open with that 20-second hug that Brian does. I do that with my kids. Mm-hmm. And I say, okay, we're going to do the 20-second hug, this 20-second hug now. Would you be willing to open your heart? Is is there something, and I always like comment on, is there something in front of your heart blocking your heart from letting love in? Would you be willing to let love from this hug from your mom or your dad into your heart. Would you be willing to let that in a little bit? And we do the 20-second hug. I'm teaching them to nurture themselves. They don't know how to do it. They are so hard on their on themselves. And really, a phrase that I use a lot is, when you see that hysterical behavior, it is historical. It is historical. It's something to do with their past. It's something mm. they're ashamed of. It's something they're scared of. And we need to recognize that in that moment, they don't want to be acting out in that way. They don't want to be so hysterical. They're trying to cope the best way they know how. And that's really what most of these maladaptive behaviors are. It's a maladaptive way of coping. They don't know any other way. So we need to show them another way. So there was, um, you know, another question about sexualized behavior. And it was a pretty long question, so I'm just going to talk about how would you pull out the strength if you saw sexualized behavior. And I wanted to talk some about that because, what that child's saying is 
this is what I need to do to cope. So, and also feel in control. I mean, coping, if you really look at what's beneath the surface of coping, it's I need to gain a sense of control here. I feel completely out of control, overwhelmed, and this is the only thing that I can do that can calm my inner sense of feeling out of control. And how does Brian phrase it? It's um, the internal way of soothing an ex... No, I don't know. He phrases oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I'm ashamed. <laughs> Any, anyone? <laughs> it's about soothing. I mean, that's yeah. It's all about like soothing. Behavior. Yeah, it's a, it's a like an external mechanism for that's soothing right. the internal dysregulation. Yeah. He has a much yeah. more eloquent way of putting it. Yeah, I mean, it's that <laughs> in a nutshell. <laughs> um, but it's the way of soothing because the soothing is I'm feeling out of control. I need to feel in control. And this is what mm-hmm. helps me feel in control. So I would admire that child and say, you know what, I admire you making the effort to feel a sense of control. And I note I see that you do that by, i.e., touching yourself down there or rubbing against I see. I see what you're doing, and I admire you for trying to do something to help yourself. You see what she's doing? I'm wondering, and this is how a parent can change that behavior, I'm wondering if you are willing, if we can find another way for you to help yourself feel good like that. And what I did with a kid in my office was... um, uh, because she wanted to feel that sensation in the lower part of her body, she would go on the ground and pull herself on the ground without um, lifting her knees, and she would just, like, drag herself across the floor so she could feel a sense of doing something different as opposed to doing that maladaptive behavior, and it's helping her. But what am I doing? I'm taking baby steps. I'm helping her not feel ashamed about that behavior. But let's try something different. And I admire you because she's saying, I can do this one way really, really good. And we want to validate that. I see how much you're trying to help yourself. I see that in you. Would you be willing? Can we create something together? to help you feel that way too, that's different, so that she does not feel criticized. Because if we start changing that behavior without her permission, she's going to feel ashamed and she's not going to be willing to change. So I want to make them a part of the communication and the change. Um, Let's see, what else? So... Another way you can focus on strengths is, now you may print out a list of strengths and go, okay, how am I going to point this out in my child? It's you're going to find any, any golden nugget you see. Wow, I really admire you for being so respectful with your brother. You're really good at that. See what I'm doing? I'm making that more prominent because you know what that kid wants? He wants to hear that, and he wants your approval more than you know, and he's going to show you in different ways now how he's going to be respectful towards his brother. I've seen it. I've seen it change kids very quickly. Uh, Even if a kid, like a teenager, gets in a fight um, and is, protecting maybe their best friend and they hit somebody, you can even find the strength in that. Wow, your friend is really important to you. I see that. He's so important that you felt compelled to do that, to protect him. Wow, you're a really good friend. I'm wondering, and I'm I'm asking you, I'm wondering... 
because they're not going to hear, you know, don't hit your friends. He just, the ch- the teenager just heard you. They're going to be willing to change their behavior because you've just recognized their strengths. And they're going to be able to hear what you're going to say next. Would you be willing, because you're such a caring person, to recognize that it's not okay to hit people, even if you're caring so much about your friends? Because you have so much strength and you care so much about people. And I've seen it in you. You have the ability to control your impulses. You can do it. I see how caring you can be. Even if you disagree with someone, you can still be caring. I'm putting that out there. They want to hear this about themselves. They want to know that they're good enough, smart enough, and that they know what to do. They just, they need us to pull it out. I had such low self-esteem for years. And as an adult, I've had to work on my own shame. It, it doesn't just go away. It's still a part of me, and I'm still growing this other part that can talk to that part of me and say, you're strong, you can do this. I'm really proud of you. You don't give up. When a child comes and tells you something and they've been harboring something, like I think one of the other questions was, wow, I really admire your honesty. You're an honest person. I see that in you. Thank you for telling me. Just that validation is key. I thank kids all the time for the littlest things. Thank you so much for saying thank you to me. It it feels good to know that you care. And let me tell you, Nancy Verrier, who wrote The Primal Wound, came to a conference that I organized last November, and she said something that, you know, really dawned on me. It's adoptees and children in foster care, we don't understand our impact on others. And that's that shame. We see our own bubble. We can't see past ourselves. We can't see... We can't fully recognize what another person is thinking, feeling about about us. So we want to hear. When we touch someone emotionally, we want to know. We want to know because it gives us a sense of belonging, connection, and validation. Wow, we really exist. Boy, thank you for sitting next to me in the movie. I feel really connected to you. Thank you for being so courageous. I saw you. You took a risk on the baseball field today. And I smiled so big in my heart. It was so great to see you out there. And to know that you're my son, I'm so proud of you. We want them to hear their impact on us. So telling your child how much what they're doing impacts you. Wow, that makes me feel really nice when you... Thank you so much. It may seem awkward and weird at first. However, it will help your child stand a little taller feel a little bit more connected, and that's only going to create a more secure attachment, and it's going to help you as a parent bond with your child. Because no parent wants to keep having to look at all these negative aspects of their child. It's painful for a parent. Let's start focusing on the strengths, on the vulnerabilities, on the little pieces that you see, bring them out, make them a big deal. 
and it's not knocking it over their head, but it's just really authentically letting your child see and hear you and how they impact you in a positive way is powerful. There's, there's a couple of things that you've said that I that I made some notes about because they just they really struck me. You kept mentioning a strength list, um, and you said that there's some online and about being authentic. And it, it occurred to me, you know, I I personally would like to pull down, you know, see if I can find a strength list, and then I, when I send out the recording of the call, I'll include that as a link. And, and it may be a great list, and it may not be a great list, but it's a starting place for us all to kind of give give the idea some thought and formulating some thoughts about the strengths of our kids. Yeah, I know um, I this one thing that I found to be really, uh, to, to really has started my day off in such a wonderful way um, when I was working at the group home with some of those really challenging teenage boys and when it was my responsibility to take care of our nephews Elijah when he was younger, um, was to go in in the morning before he would wake up. And we got to a place where he would look forward to it because I'd rub his head or his back and I would just talk to him about what a great kid he was before the day began, before my stress level was up, before my fear was triggered, and my own insecurity. And it, you know, just kind of gave us a really nice starting ground. And so I just want to offer that as a, a great time of the day to offer those observances of strength to your children and to yourself. Because it's so easy to get caught up in all those, right. all the negatives and the, the voices of the world, you know, telling us we're not enough parents. And, you know, there's, there can be so many triggers for us as parents that in many ways the very thing that Jeanette is asking us to give to our children, we need to. We need to be seen and we need to be admired and we need to be heard and we need to be accepted right where we're at and um so i offer that to you i offer that the adoption parents in your circle sees you and hears you and they accept and admire you and that you don't give up and you keep trying i mean and, i can um, email you these to phrases. connect with each other with yeah. yourself with your children and i admire that uh christy can you hear me can, can. you hear me yes yes oh I can yes, email you ahead. the list of strengths and vulnerabilities that I give to my families, and then you can send it out to everyone on the call. Oh, that'd so that be they great. can start yeah. memorizing that's how do you do this. You know, nice. I see how caring you are with your brother. If, 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 even if the play with the, with the, with the sibling set and they fight all the time, I want that parent to observe and watch for the moment that they can come in and go, wow, you were so nice. You are so caring. That was so nice, and you gave your brother that toy. You're so caring. I see that in you. Is there an age limit to feeling good when okay. somebody said something like that to you? There you said is you worked no with a lot of adults. Yes. And I'll tell you, a lot of adult adoptees today did not get this because parents – we're not educated on shame. I mean, shame is, understanding shame is a concept that I don't think is talked about enough because people think, well, why can't he take responsibility? Why, is, why doesn't he have any guilt? Because they're living in shame. They feel completely deficient. And when the parent is going to point out the negative aspect, you're a liar. That's exactly what you're going to get. A liar. That kid's going to show you, oh, I'm a liar? I'm going to show you a liar. <laughs> then that's all that that child's going to give. So I, I do an adult adoptee group here. A lot of them have this piece of shame. And they're walking around with it. So I teach them how to reparent themselves and do that self-talk focusing on their strengths 
Young adults need this. Um, we all have shame to, you know, we all have different levels of shame due to our early experiences. We, you know, even in a biological family, shame can be developed. If a parent, you know, a child goes to their parent and the parent dismisses them, dismisses their feelings, then the child doesn't feel that their feelings are important. There's something wrong with them. Why do I even have feelings? Oh, my gosh, I need to push this away. Well, what gets repressed will be expressed. It has to. <laughs> and we'll come it, back to something greater. <laughs> yeah. What's hysterical will be is is hysterical. It's got to express. You know, and oh gosh, I love that. That's such a nice phrase. And you know that's true for all of us. You know, when yeah. when when our hysterical child is experiencing their history, then our inner hysterical hysterics can get triggered just as easily. And that's our history and it's so that dance is so intense sometimes. It surely I mean, is. But that's yeah. such a nice hysterical historical that that's so nice to be able to pull that, you know, those little phrases that can come in handy, those little nuggets we can pull out of our yeah. pocket. The reactivity is our own unfinished business, you know. It's all um, reworded. Absolutely. Um, and I just wanted to point out, you know, it's the kid that goes and makes, like, crazy things out of nothing. You know, like, you go in their room, and the child's, like, put every toy, you know, in a pyramid, right? And what does the parent do? But they become reactive in that moment. What is happening here? The first thing I would tell a parent is first go in there, see what the child has done, be curious, because the moment you start evaluating a negative motive, you've lost that child. They will have to defend themselves, and they will go in that fear-based state. If you can stay curious and go, oh, even if you don't like what the child's doing, oh, what's that? And then point out a strength. Wow, you're really creative. I see how creative you are. And then say, I love your creativity. Would you be willing next time to maybe use this, this, and this, and not every toy in your room? I guarantee you that child is going to be willing to limit that behavior because you heard them, and now they can hear you. It's the win-win situation. Right. Stephen Covey says, first seek to understand and then to be understood. Yes, the child is, is more likely to accept, you know, the limit and change their behavior. Yeah. When we, um, yeah, we, have, we have about five minutes left on the call, and I want to uh -huh. give you a chance to talk a little bit about a couple of the, the books that you have uh -huh. that you put together. I know um, we talked, you told me a little bit about your intervention book. And I want to I want you to have a chance to talk about it, and then when we send out the recording, I want to be sure and include that um, link for people to be able to pick that up from your uh, from your online store because I think it's it's amazing. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I I developed, gosh, about I have like thirty in my head and thirty in a book <laughs> interventions <laughs> that I do with children who have been in foster care and or were adopted. I use these in my practice. I teach social workers, clinicians all across Los Angeles, and I teach parents these interventions because you don't have to come to a therapist like me to be able to do these. You can purchase this book, do these interventions, and they're clearly laid out what you'll be working on if it's shame. If it's helping a child understand their narrative, which is so, so important, helping a child regulate anger, helping a child regulate sadness, um, like my, I have a sad bag. It provides a containment for the sadness. It teaches children 16 coping skills to do with their sadness. I'll tell you, resiliency in children comes from taking action. When a child takes action, 
They feel less helpless. That's why coping skills are very important. They need them. Kids need to know what to do when I have sadness, when I have anger, and know that there are opportunities out there to express it because anger is a good thing. We need to be able to express anger in a healthy way. We don't want to stuff anger. We want to be able to release it and project it out so we can regulate it. Um, so I, it's anger bag, sad bag. Um, I do these, um, uh, like, for instance, um, erupt a volcano. We erupt our feelings. We make a clay volcano, and I let the ch- child put the feelings into the volcano, and then they erupt them out, uh, erupt them out. And what the child is learning to do is express, release, and also project and talk about what it is they're feeling and regulate it. I mean, what these interventions do is it helps a child take the shame out of therapy and take the shame out of expressing ourselves. They're fun. They have all the materials you need for each intervention, um, and they work on the core issues for an adopted or foster youth. So you can get the book on my website, and I also have it in a DVD, so I explain piece by piece how to do them and show you an example in the DVD. And so my website is www.yoftherapy, which is Y-O-2-F's like Frank E, therapy.com. And and I'll be sending a – well, actually, I know a lot of people clicked over from the information that we sent about tonight's call, but I'll also, um, when we send out a recording of the call to all the people who signed up, um, I'll be sure and include the screen list and some information about the, the DVD in the book and a link so that they can click over and pick that up, take a look at what you're doing. Jeanette, yeah. thank you so much. I really uh, – you know, it's great to be able to, to hear um, another voice that speaks from the same philosophy. Um, it just, I think, you know, just brings more to the table and gives us such a rich flavor of, of things. And, you know, just like for our kids to have something to do that helps them feel empowered, the same for, for all of us as parents and teachers and professionals, and, and you've given us a very nice list of things to do to actively. And Brian always talks a lot about our internal experiences that drive our behaviors and our emotions. And and I know that we're all very uh, always mindful and aware of that element. Um, But it's so nice to have something to do. Thank you for giving us something to do. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. And I hope it's helpful and You know, it's going to take time, but I'll tell you, I've seen results rather quickly with this type of of focus. It, it, It turns kids around. It really does. And we need to build their self esteem, not knock it down. Because they're already doing that inside themselves. Yeah. So I wish you all well. Just real quick about some of the changes that are taking place with the inner circle. Um, the Adoption Parenting Inner Circle. Um, We've created some various levels of membership so that all, uh, we have all different um, options. Um, A a green option where people get a copy of the Monthly Love Revolution Journal and an MP3, um, as well as um, a membership level where hard copies and CDs are sent out, as well as the ability to access our gurus by email, and we always respond. Um, And to let you know that we'll be bringing more like-minded, love-based professionals and parents to come and speak to us and share their golden nuggets. Um, Dr. Marcy has been fabulous, and she will continue to be a very strong guiding force. Um, In April, Eric Guy, who has been a long, long long-time friend of our family, 
will be joining us to be the host of our call, similar to as Jeanette was tonight. And I think Jeanette will be back with us in the future. I'm not sure when. Mm-hmm. And so I just want to um, to make sure everyone's aware and to mark your calendars for the third Tuesday of every month and uh, be looking for those emails with the recordings in our new electronic version of the journal where you can actually put this in the journal to to make purchases or to read further or to connect with a guest writer who might be featured and have their own website or their Facebook page just to try to really create a sense of community and to um, help us know that we've got we've got many great resources and it hasn't always been that way hasn't been that no <laughs> it hasn't, hasn't always been a professional they're right. speaking there and I, I just want to say one thing if I may and this teenager who I worked with that was very resistant to any type of change, he said, Jeanette, I want you to read this quote on your call tonight. I said, really? So if I can say what he asked me to tell everyone, he has learned, it's unbelievable. My life is not the hardest nor the worst, but it has changed me as a person. Okay? This was someone who was living in shame and has now come so far doing this focus on strengths. And it's just amazing. It really is. He can see the goodness in his life now. He couldn't see it before. And he's willing to change, which is fantastic. So I just... I just want I, can't, to I can't think of a better net first to end on. <laughs> Change is possible. And so with that, is there is there anything else you would like to add? <laughs> I think I'm good. I'm just I'm grateful. I to think be I'm here. too. I'm great. I had such a good time. I hope everybody I great who time. called in too. There is much love here. Thank yes. you, Jeanette. Thank you, Christy. Okay, go ahead and close this out. Okay, good night.